Hello, there's only one person here besides me. Can you confirm that you're hearing me? Yes, I can. And it looks like there's nine. I can hear you. Oh, really? There's nine people? I was only getting one. Let me look again. Oh, yeah, nine. Okay. Um, I got the computer working. It turns out the new laptops have a shutter on the camera. And that's why uh, I didn't get it uh, working last time. The camera had the shutter on and I didn't know I had to take it off. So anyways, that's uh, the story there. It's a little dark. Uh, let me see if I can get some natural light in here. This will only work for a little while. I don't know if that's helping or not. Probably not. Okay, um, any questions before we begin? All right, I have some of my files back that uh, I lost. I had to remake them, meaning I didn't uh, get them from the computer I lost, but uh, at least I have the files, most of them now. Uh, let's see what uh, I wrote down where we left off. I 51. I don't think I'm sharing my screen yet. All right, let me share my screen. I'm sort of talking to myself here, if you didn't hear that. I just said, let me. All right, so uh, today is November 1st. Hopefully you had a happy Halloween. And uh, we are supposed to be starting chapter eight. We're not there. In fact, are we on chapter five? Did we not start chapter six? I believe that we started chapter six and we were like maybe like 20 or 30 slides into chapter six. Yeah, I have on slide 51, but that was uh, I think for the wrong one. Uh, slide 56, she said, or 26? I don't remember exactly which one. I just, I know that we had started six. You think we'd started six. All right. I'm, let me see. I was using this computer. Maybe I've recorded it. Oh, where do I find that here? So according to this, we stopped off at that slide. Is that correct? I don't think so. I think we're at agar. Someplace around here. Yes, that's what my notes have. Hmm, I don't have anything. Um, so we talked about agar. And did we talk about the different types of media? The chemically defined media? I'm sorry, I'm not remembering where we stopped off and I don't have it marked in my slide. Uh, can anyone else confirm what was the last topic we talked about? Uh, 
All right, there's no confirmation. So I'm just going to go that we talked about agar and I will continue talking about this slide, different types of culture media. Uh, there's a chemically defined media where the exact chemical composition is known in the media. And that's because we make it, we put in all the ingredients. Uh, normally, uh, chemically defined media are used for growing autotrophs because they don't need a lot of additives. Like many growth factors may be required for organisms that uh, we call fastidious. And oftentimes, fastidious organisms, we don't know exactly what they need to grow. Like, um, just a minute, I'm trying to remember the name of it. Um, the bacteria that causes syphilis, they've never been able to get it to grow in tissue culture. And they've been trying for over 100 years now. And uh, they don't know what it requires in order to grow. Streptococcus pyogenes, we know, requires something from the blood, and that one causes strep throat. Uh, personally, I don't know what Streptococcus pyogenes needs. It, it might be just uh, uh, maybe NAD, I don't know. But uh, anyways, fastidious organisms require many additives, and these are not usually added in a chemically defined media. Let me blow this up, if I can do that. Sorry, this one's a little different. So I'm having a hard time uh, operating it. So this media is one where we put in all of the ingredients in the media. There's five grams of glucose, uh, one gram of ammonium phosphate, five grams of sodium chloride, 0 0.2 grams of magnesium sulfate, and one gram of potassium phosphate. And then we add water. And usually they add distilled water, so you're not adding much from the water. Okay? And this is a chemically defined media that... Uh, is one where we know all the things we add, but you can see we're adding a whole bunch of different things to it. And this would be for growing a fastidious organism that requires the amino acid cysteine, the amino acid arginine. Mm, what else does it require? Uh, the amino acid, I mean, not the amino acid, the vitamin thiamine, uracil, biotin, so a bunch of uh, vitamins. Okay. All right. Let's go to the next slide. So we, the other media we have are complex media. And when we're talking about things like triptych soy auger, TSA, or nutrient auger, NA, that is a complex media. It contains extracts and digests of yeast, meat, or plants. And these provide vitamins or organic growth factors needed for the organisms to grow. The exact chemical composition is not known and can vary from lot to lot. For example, this complex media has beef extract in it, three grams, and a lot will differ from another lot as to what the exact chemicals are in the beef because one cow will eat one thing and another cow will eat another thing. And so the molecules in the cows will be different. Any question about that? Complex media often have, but don't always have, peptone, which is a partially digested protein. And that is both the primary energy source, a source of carbon, a source of nitrogen, and it's the source for sulfur. Uh, complex media are frequently used to grow heterotrophs and fungi. These organisms require an organic carbon source, but they don't require a lot of other additives. 
And E. coli would be an example that we grow on a complex media. Any question about any of that? There are different types of culture media. There is an anaerobic media, which is important for growing obligate anaerobes. These organisms must avoid exposure to oxygen. We use a reducing media, which is an anaerobic media, and it contains chemicals in it that combine and remove oxygen. One example is so sodium thioglycolate, and we talked about this media, the, uh, the uh, media we use for growing organisms that have a specific oxygen requirement, uh, thioglycolate media. Uh, the thioglycolate is a chemical that uh, chemically uh, combines with oxygen, removing it from the media. You heat the media, which drives off the oxygen. But once you take the tube out of the autoclave, oxygen starts moving in from the top and the top of the thioglycolate tube will be uh, complete oxygen, which is around 20 to 21%. And then when you go down the tube, there's less oxygen. At the bottom of the tube, there's essentially no oxygen. Any question about that? There's also selective media. This has chemicals in it that halt or inhibit the growth of particular microorganisms. One example is 7% sodium chloride media. Most organisms cannot grow in 7% sodium chloride. They can only grow in up to maybe 2% sodium chloride. And so if we grow something on 7% sodium chloride, you are selecting four organisms that can grow on 7% sodium chloride. And other organisms cannot grow, they're selected against on the 7% sodium chloride media. Any questions about any of that? There's also differential media. These media provide differences between different species. The differences are not related to how well the organism can grow on the media. The differences are usually visual. There could be color differences, or there are other differences in the growth on the plate. So there are visible differences usually on the plate for two species growing on a differential media. An example of a differential media is blood auger, and it shows us differences in the hemolytic activity of different species of bacteria. Just a minute, let me get that down here. Trying to blow this up, come on. That's not working. Oh, from that button. That's why it's not working. Okay. Um, in blood auger, you can have organisms which have no hemolysis, which is also called gamma hemolysis. And there's a gamma. Oops, went to the wrong one. Click that, didn't mean to. The white is the growth of bacteria. The red is the blood auger. And as you can see, the red goes all the way up to the growth of the bacteria no hemolysis. There's also alpha hemolysis, and that would be the darkened ring around the white bacteria. If you look inside the alpha right there, all of this region is a darker red than here, and we have a ring of darker. And that ring of darker, and sometimes it looks greenish, is from the partial hemolysis of the red blood cells. Any question about that? And here we have beta hemolysis. The white B or beta is the growth of bacteria. And then this clear region around it is from the complete hemolysis of the red blood cells. You can actually see through the plate in this clear region. Okay, any question about any of that?
There's also uh, selective and differential media. This is a media which is both selective and differential. An example of one is the EMB plates, that's eosine, myosine blue, or EMB plates. Let me see if I can end this. It's selective in that this plate selects against gram-positive bacteria, but gram-negatives can grow on the plate. So if there's growth, it's most likely gram-negative. It's differential on the basis of lactose fermentation. If the bacteria can ferment the sugar lactose, which is present in the plate, then the bacteria will turn blackish or greenish, metallic green color. If the bacteria cannot ferment the sugar lactose, the bacteria will not be black or greenish. And usually they're white or off-white or um, the normal color of the bacteria. No lactose fermentation, but gram negative. Any question about any of that? There's also an enrichment media, which this media encourages the growth of certain strains of bacteria to grow. So it is selective because it selects against other uh, bacteria from growing. However, it's used differently than a selective media in that it's not used only for selection. It's used to increase the number of desired microbes to bring them up to detectable levels. It's particularly useful if the targeted microorganism is only a small proportion of the total population. For example, let's say that we were looking for a bacteria from uh, the feces of a patient who had gastroenteritis. Well, the patient has lots of bacteria in their feces, and the one causing the gastroenteritis could be present at small numbers. So we would have to use an enrichment media in order to determine or to find the organism which is causing the problem. So enrichment media is often used for bacteria that we're obtaining from the soil, fecal samples, or other environmental samples because there will be so many other bacteria from the sample. Any question about that? An example of enrichment media is, let's say that we're looking for a phenol degrading bacteria. And there's only a few of them in the soil, and there's thousands, maybe millions of other bacteria in the soil. What we could do is take our sample from the soil and put it in an enrichment media where the only uh, source of carbon is phenol. So phenol is the only carbon source and the only energy source. You grow up the sample you grow and get from the soil, and that would, let's say, enrich tenfold. If the bacteria is one in a thousand fold, you would bring it up to one in a hundred, which is just barely possible to get. But what you could do is take from that sample, the tube that was an enrichment media, and grow it in another enrichment media. If you get another tenfold increase in the organism that you were looking for, then the chance of getting it from streaking it out on a plate will be possible because there will be one in 10 of the colonies will be a colony of interest, a phenol degrading bacteria. Any question about any of that? So what you do is you just uh, grow it in the enrichment media. And if you need to, you just transfer it to another enrichment tube. And you can do that a couple of times if needed. All right, this slide is showing you just a, a summary of the different types of media, the chemically defined media, the complex media, a reducing media, 
a selective media, a differential media, and an enrichment media. And then don't forget there's also a selective and differential media. And this media is both selective and differential. And I think we discussed that in the lab. All right. Usually in microbiology, if we're studying an organism in the lab, we want to have a peer culture. That's a culture that contains only one species. Because if you don't have a peer culture and the test is positive, you don't know if one organism is positive and which one was positive, or if all of them are positive, or if just some of them are positive. So you need a peer culture, and then you can say, this species is positive for this test. A colony is a population of cells arising from a single cell or from a small group of cells that are attached together. So if the colony is formed by more than one cell, we don't call it uh, when we count the number of colonies, like on a viable plate count, we don't say how many cells there were in the sample that we used to set up the viable plate count. We say that there are so many colony forming units, or CFUs, in the sample that we use to set up the viable plate count meaning we're saying that the colony is formed by one or a few cells, but we call it a colony forming unit. To obtain single colonies is critical part of obtaining a peer culture. And what we usually do to get a peer culture is you streak your bacteria once on a plate and you streak it for getting isolated colonies. You take that isolated colony, and you streak it out on a second plate to get isolated colonies a second time. And then you pick from that colony, one colony that's been isolated, and because it's gone, the cells in that colony have gone through two colony forming events, the chance that that uh, will be a pure culture will be 95% or greater. If you only streak it out one time, the chance that you will get a pure culture is only about 70%. And that's just not high enough for working in microbiology. Any question about any of that? All right. So in uh, the lab, we talked about how you get a, a uh, streak plate. And that is you get your bacteria. Pretend my mouse is a loop and you pick the uh, bacteria, we'll scrape it from this plate here, and then you streak it out on the loop. And normally you streak it out about 20 to 30 times with your loop. And then you go back and you sterilize your loop in the back to incinerator, and then you cool the loop, usually by touching it on the auger where there's no bacteria. And then you start the next sector. And how you pick up cells to put in sector two is you take your streak through sector one, but you do not take through sector one where the cells are heaviest, and that would be this region. You go through sector one where the cells are the most dilute, and that would be this region. And then you pick up cells from sector one to set up sector two. And you want to go through sector one at least three times. And this one, they've done it much more than that. It's gone through one, two, three, four, five times. Usually you just go through three times. And then you start sector two. Okay. And then you sterilize your loop again, cool it on the auger, and then you pick up cells. Uh, streak out sector three and you pick up cells from sector two. This only shows that uh, you went through sector two 
one time. So what you should do is go through three times. So start in sector three over here, come down over here. And usually you don't go so far into sector two. You, you go where in sector two where it's uh, diluted. So you come in around here and then go back, come in back. And you come into sector two three times. And then you streak out sector three. The goal is, is that you're going to have a dilution from here to here in sector one. And then a dilution from about here to there in sector two. And then a dilution from this region in sector three to that region. And sector two will be more dilute than sector one. And sector three will be more dilute than sector two. And the goal is to eventually get isolated colonies. It doesn't matter where the isolated colonies are. They can be in sector three, which is here, but they could be in sector two or even in sector one. It doesn't matter where they are. We're just doing a dilution and streak plating so that we'll get isolated colonies. Uh, if you had a real dilute, uh, culture to set up sector one, you might get your isolated colonies in this region of sector one. Remember, streak plating works well if the microorganism that we want to isolate on a, as a pure culture, as a pure colony, is high in numbers. If it's low in numbers, you'd have to grow the bacteria in an enrichment culture before trying to streak it out. Any questions about any of that? And as you can see in this culture here, we had a mixed population. We have two cells, the red colonies and the yellow colonies. The red colonies, if we wanted to get a pure culture, we would probably be able to get it from isolating these colonies. The yellow colonies, we'd have to streak it out at least once more because these aren't really isolated. You'd want to streak it out on a, uh, through two colony forming events, regardless of what colony you streak, the yellow or the red. All right, microbes generally grow by binary fission. That's where a cell literally splits in two. There are a few bacteria that grow by budding, where cells form an outgrowth, a small bud, and that bud will enlarge until it eventually becomes close to the size of the parent cell. And then the bud will break off and be its own um, own permanent cell. And there are a few species of bacteria that also reproduce by reproductive spores. A reproductive spore is not an endospore. The reproductive spores are usually tips of a filament. And uh, let me see if I can draw this. I don't think I have this set up on this computer, so I might not be able to draw this that one down. Ah, I don't know how to work this program. There we go. Uh, a reproductive spore is usually on a bacteria, and the bacteria will typically be a large parent cell, and it'll stand up, and then it'll make little spores at the tip. And the purpose of the spores at the tip is they're more likely to be carried by the wind or picked up by an animal. And then they will go elsewhere to uh, grow. Anyways, that's a reproductive spore. 
And it's reproduction because one parent cell produces several reproductive spores. So this is reproduction. And usually the parent cell stays alive. So once the spores are gone, the parent cell is still here. Any questions about reproductive spores? A reproductive spore is different from an endospore. An endospore is not reproduction. Uh, an endospore is a survival strategy, not a reproductive strategy. Let's talk a little bit more about uh, binary fission. There we go. And the cell literally divides in two. First, the cell will replicate its DNA. And then one molecule will move to this side of the cell. One molecule of move, DNA will move to that side of the cell. And then the cell literally splits in two by growing a cell membrane and a cell wall in between the two DNA molecules, separating the cell into two. And this is actually an electron microscopic image of a cell about to split into two by binary fission. And then the cells will separate and then they will grow, they will elongate, and then they'll go through this process once again. Binary fission, any question about any of that? The way most bacteria grow. And there are some cells, bacteria, which grow by, let me see if this works on the new computer. Maybe. Yep, it is, okay. So Microsoft changed that and now that works. Now, how do I get this to go? Ah, here it is. Here we have a uh, little bud forming on this cell here. Let's see if I can blow this up. And the bud enlarges. And there we can see the DNA molecule dividing and one molecule DNA moves into the bud. You can actually see that. And then the bud gets close to the size of the parent cell. And you see how the cell wall is now formed between the uh, bud and the parent cell. It's its own cell now. And this cell is now beginning to grow a bud here. And this cell is starting to grow a bud here. Anyway, some bacteria grow by budding. And this is a budding process occurring in yeast. I'm showing you yeast because it's a little bigger than bacteria. When we're talking about bacterial growth, you should realize that they have a generation time and humans have a generation time too. That is the time required for a cell to divide into two, but it's also the same time as the population to size to double. The human population doubles between 17 and 19 years. Uh, bacteria can be have a doubling time as quickly as every 20 minutes. E. coli is one of the fastest bacteria to grow. And it, when it's growing its fastest, can have a generation time of 20 minutes. Most bacteria aren't as quick. Most bacteria have a generation time between one and three hours. But the mycobacterium are slower at growing and microbacterium leprae, the bacteria that causes leprosy, actually has a doubling time of 10 days. So one cell will not become two cells until 10 days have passed. Uh, the reason why microbacterium is slow at growing is partially because it has mycolic acid in the cell wall and it takes the cell a fairly long time to make mycolic acid. 
you should know when we're talking about the generation time being 20 minutes, that we mean it takes 20 minutes per generation. So the per generation is often uh, assumed, meaning it's not stated. But when we're talking about a generation time of 20 minutes, we mean 20 minutes per generation. And this does give students some trouble because most of us are thinking like 60 miles per hour. The generation time is not the number of generations per time or per hour. It is the um, time per generation. Do you got that? All right. Try and remember that because there will probably be a quiz question on the generation time. When we're talking about bacterial growth, microbiologists like to use log scales. And it's actually a semi-log scale. Uh, we do plot on the x-axis a normal arithmetic scale. But on the y-axis, if we plotted the growth of bacteria on a normal arithmetic scale, we would get a graph shaped like this. Okay, one cell would divide into two, two cells into four, four cells into eight, eight cells into 16, 16 cells into 32. And you can see all of those early points are over here and none of them are shown because they'd be all lumped together, especially the one, two, and the four. Okay, the 16 will be about halfway through. So maybe we could put in the 16 here. So all the early points are all come together. And then the next point here, so the uh, 1,000 is about here, or excuse me, a million is about here. The next point will be up on the ceiling because this is an exponential graph. Do you guys understand that? This curve is exponential. So the next point will be on the ceiling. If we were to use a semi-log plot, two things, well, three things actually happen. First of all, you scatter out the points here. So they're not all together in this region. They would be scattered right there. And I'm not sure where they would all be because they're not drawn in here. The first one might actually be one of them because this is a, a log scale than the numbers. And to tell you the truth, I'm not sure how many a log of about 1.51 is in the arithmetic scale. I just don't know. I'd have to do the math on that. The next point is here, the next point is here, the next point is here. And the next point isn't gonna be on the ceiling. The next point is going to be about right here. So we could extend it and put it on this graph. So the points down here are scattered out better than they are in arithmetic scale. And then the next point isn't on the ceiling. We can actually put it on the graph. You just have to draw the graph out a little. And then the third advantage of using the semi-log plot is the mathematical equation to explain the growth is really easy. It's simply y equals mx plus b. It's a linear relationship shown here. And the mathematical relationship for here is much more complex. It would be something like y equals mx times nx squared uh, plus B, something like that. Any question about that? So usually we like to draw the graph of the growth of bacteria on a semi-log plot where the number of cells is graphed as a log number, but the generation time is still arithmetic. Semi-log plot. When we're talking about the phases of growth of bacteria, oops, went too far. We normally get a plot looking like this. And this is actually very common growth curve. 
not only of bacteria, but of other organisms as well. In fact, somebody once uh, put deer on an island and then logged the growth of the deer on the island, and they followed this uh, growth curve, okay? So initially, you move the bacteria into a new environment, the bacteria enter the lag phase. The lag phase is where the bacteria are put in the new environment till the time when the bacteria start to grow. The bacteria are in lag because it's a new environment. The bacteria are making the enzymes they need to grow in the new environment. And this could be as simple as uh, transferring bacteria from a solid media into a liquid media. So it could be a simple change like that. The bacteria enter a lag phase, make the enzymes and molecules they need to grow in that media, and then they begin to grow. The growth, once they begin to grow, is logarithmic or exponential, meaning the bacteria grow exponentially. The reason why they grow exponentially is initially, the bacteria are few in number, the nutrients are many, the space is much, and the waste products are very low if, uh, or non-existent at the beginning. Okay. And as we grow the bacteria, the bacteria population numbers increase, and then the bacteria number growth starts to slow. That would be the S curve right here where the curve starts to bend. Why the bacteria slow down in their growth is because the nutrients now are becoming limited. They're not as plentiful as they used to be. The waste products are accumulating and so there's more waste around now. And the waste can be uh, toxic or detrimental to the growth of the bacteria. And then the third thing that why the growth will happen is the bacteria uh, can start running out of room. There is more bacteria around, there's less free room around. So the bacteria numbers start to slow. Eventually the bacteria numbers slow, the growth slows so that we reach a stationary phase. In the stationary phase, the total bacteria population numbers stay about the same. There's no increase in numbers, there's no decrease in numbers of the population. That doesn't mean the, grow, the cells aren't growing, it's just that the number of cells growing is equal to the number of cells dying. The cells that are lucky have some nutrients around them, they have some free space around them to grow, and they don't have very much waste products around them, so they can grow. The unlucky cells will die because they have few nutrients around them, lots of waste products around them, and they may have little or no space around them. Okay, so the population stationary. As that population continues to grow, it will eventually come into the death or decline phase where the population numbers start to decrease. Initially, in the death or decline phase, there may be some lucky cells which are actually growing. It's just that more cells are dying than cells are growing. So the population numbers decreases. However, late, in the death or decline phase, we have no cells that are growing. The cells are only dying in this phase. And this will go on, the death or decline phase, until the population number reaches zero. How long that will take will depend on the species. If the species is, um, one that not, isn't very good at surviving, like E. coli uh, dies fairly quickly, this death will occur in about two weeks, two or three weeks. 
all the cells will be dead in about two or three weeks. However, if the species makes endospores, those cells can survive for millennia, a long, long time. Okay? So it depends on the species how long the decline phase will be. Any questions about the four growth phases and what causes each growth phase? So remember in the lag phase, the total population isn't growing, individual cells aren't growing. In the log phase, the total population is growing. Uh, initially, all the cells are growing. Uh, then we enter the stationary phase where the population number stays the same. Each individual cell could be growing or could be dying. It's just the growth equals the death. And then in the death phase, there are more cells dying than there are cells growing. All right, uh, let's quickly go through this last group of slides. There are a number of methods used to measure microbial growth. There are direct methods that in directly count individual cells. And then there are indirect methods which do not directly count individual cells. Uh, one direct method, which is frequently used in microbiology, is the plate count, called the viable plate count. It's called the viable plate count because it only counts viable cells. There's also the filtration method, the most probable number method, and the direct microscopic count. I have done, used all of these methods, except for the most probable number. I've never done that. But I've done turbidity, I've done metabolic activity, I've done dry weight. So I've done all of the methods except for the most probable number. Uh, the plate count measures the number of viable cells in a solution. It does take time, about 24 hours or more, for colonies to form from individual colonies or colony forming units. The results are usually reported as colony forming units because we don't know if a colony was formed by a single cell or by a clump of cells, which could be two or more cells. What you do to get the plate count is you make a serial dilution and you usually make several dilutions and then inoculate auger plates from each dilution. You then count colonies on plates that total 25 to 250 colonies. And I'll explain why in just a minute. And then you estimate the number of bacteria in the original sample from your dilution that was used to plate uh, the plate. You can use the poor plate method or the straight spread plate method. That's just how you put the sample on the plate. Here is how we make a serial dilution. We have an original inoculum, which has probably a large number of cells in it. You take one mil of your original and you dilute it into nine mils. So the dilution is one to 10. You then mix that up, take one mil of this, and put it into nine other mils. That's another one to 10 dilution. That's two one to 10 dilutions. So this is a one to 100 dilution. You multiply the first dilution by the second dilution, and that's why it's one to 100. You can then take mix it up, take a mil of that, put it into nine mils, and there's a one to 1,000, one to 10,000, one to 100,000. You then can... Uh, uh, pour the uh, dilutions on the plate. And usually if we're pouring, we add one mil and then mix it over the plate. Usually what you do is you don't spread it, rotate it like that. What you do is you rotate the plate back and forth. Can you see me doing this? And that's just to get the solution containing the bacteria everywhere on the plate. 
The other way of doing it is you put a small aliquot and it could be 0.1 mil or maybe one mil and then you spread it around on the plate with a spreader and you do sterilize the spreader before you use it. And then you incubate the plate and then get colonies growing on the plate. The different dilutions will give different number of colonies. This one is giving four colonies. This one is giving, I don't know, about 30 colonies. This one is giving so many colonies that we can't count them all. Uh, this region here and that region there, the colonies are together, so we just can't count them. And these clearly are too many to count, okay? What you do is you count the colonies that gives 25 to 250 colonies, because that'll be our best estimate on the mean. Uh, let's go over 30 colonies, plus or minus one colony is only about plus or minus 3.3% if I did that correctly. So it's 30 colonies per mil of the original solution times the dilution of one in 10,000. And then that's plus or minus three for our mean. If we were to take the count from here, it's four. Okay. But that would be plus or minus one fourth. That's 25%. Okay. So it's a much greater error for that plus or minus than if we were to use this. So that's why we use this because we have a better estimate of our mean a better accuracy of the mean than if we were to use this plate. Any question about any of that? Can somebody confirm that you're still there? I'm still here. Yes. All right. uh, the filtration method is used when the bacterial numbers are very dilute, such as when we're testing the drinking water Hopefully there aren't many bacteria in our drinking water. And what you would do would be take, I don't know, a volume of drinking water, like maybe a liter, and then pass it through a filter. The filter has pores that allow the water to, to go through, but the filter keeps the bacteria. And then you take the filter and put it on a plate of media. And then you allow the bacteria to grow. Okay, so the filtration method is only used when the bacteria are very low in numbers. The direct microscopic count is where you actually count the number of cells under the microscope. You usually use a gridded slide for doing that. And this gridded slide has a specific volume of liquid that it can take under the slide. Let me show this up. Usually on a gridded slide, you count one big square right here. And then the number of cells you count in this big square will be multiplied by a million because you're, you've got one microliter here of your sample. And if your bacteria are too, too uh, numerous, you could always dilute it and then just multiply by your dilution. Uh, this method works very well for a bacteria that are not multile, but multile bacteria will be very difficult to count because let's say you're counting this row here and then this one moves out. And that's when these two move in. So what's your count? Okay. So with multile bacteria, it's very difficult to count. Another problem with the uh, direct count method is we can't tell is this cell alive or is it dead? We can't tell. So you count all the cells and you count both living viable cells and dead cells. In fact, all the methods 
except for the viable plate count, count both viable and dead cells. Uh, this method is fairly quick and you get a direct count, uh, but it's a little hard on the eyes for the poor smuck who has to count the cells because you got to do it under the microscope. Not too bad, but it's not the fastest way. I suppose it is faster than the plate counts because that you got to plate, make the cereal dilution, plate it, and then grow it. Uh, the advantage of the plate count is you're counting viable cells. Um, I'm not going to talk about the most probable number, but I will talk briefly about the indirect methods. Turbidity is measuring the light that comes through the media. So the media allows light to come through and we measure the amount of light that comes through. If we have bacteria in the media, that blocks some of the light from getting through. And so we can measure this difference, compare it to that, and then get an estimate of our cells. You do need to have a chart showing uh, what the uh, absorbance or uh, turbidity is to get your estimate number, but uh, somebody has to work that out and then you make the chart and then you can use this chart repeatedly time and time again. And you just compare, like I said, the absorbance of the bacteria solution with the absorbance of the media without any bacteria in it. Any questions about this? This is probably the quickest way to get the count. You just take uh, a tube of it, get your absorbance, look on a chart, and then you see, okay, I've got so many bacteria per mil. Another way to get the uh, uh, bacteria is to measure a metabolic activity. This assumes that uh, the bacterial metabolism accumulates in direct proportion to the number of bacteria present. Usually when we're measuring something like the acid produced or the amount of CO2 produced, the more cells you have, the more uh, metabolic activity you'll see. And once again, you just measure what you have like your CO2 being produced, and then look on a chart and then get your estimate for the number of cells you have. Any question about metabolic activity? The last one is the dry weight. It is a, a way to measure cells. And what you do is you centrifuge down the cells and then you dry the cells and then you weigh them at your leisure, the dry weight will increase as the number of cells increase. And then you look on a chart and then you determine how many cells you have. The advantage of this way is uh, certainly that uh, you can determine the number by weighing it at your leisure. Because once you dry the cells, you can weigh it whenever you want. It could be immediately after they're dry, or you could do it the next day, or the next week, or maybe even the next month. Uh, this method is not satisfactory for filamentous bacteria and fungi because they have an unusual shape, and the cells may not be uniform in their weight. All right, any question about the different methods we have for counting cells? If there's no questions, let me move on to our next topic. Uh, microbial genetics. Oh, let me warn you, you're having a quiz on uh, chapters five and six. We just finished six on Wednesday, and uh, uh, the quiz will also be on lab seven. 
Uh, I can tell you that I just started grading, I think it was quiz two, but it, maybe it was quiz three. So at least half the questions of that quiz are graded. You can go take a look at that if you want. I'll try and finish grading that quiz tonight. Chapter eight is on the genetics of microbes. So know the terms, be able to describe replication, that's DNA replication, RNA transcription, and protein translation, and understand the different types of mutation. We'll talk about different types of mutation. Any questions about what we're covering in chapter eight? We're first going to talk about the structure and function of the genetic material. We'll talk about the flow of genetic information. We'll talk about DNA replication, RNA transcription, and protein translation. We'll then talk about the regulation of bacterial gene expression, and that uses operons. We'll briefly talk about different types of mutations. We'll then move on to the genetic transfer and recombination. And then lastly, we'll talk about genes and evolution. So genetics is the study of what genes are, how they carry information, and that how that information is expressed and how genes are replicated. A gene is a segment of DNA that encodes a functional product. The product is usually a protein, but it doesn't have to be. It might be RNA, like the tRNA gene. The functional product is tRNA. Here we're seeing a chromosome. Let me see if I can blow that up. And there we have the DNA molecule making up the chromosome. And it's highly coiled here, by the way. And here we have in one region of the DNA, gene one, and then another region of the DNA, gene two. And you'll notice. There's a region of DNA which is not a gene, non-coding information. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a little bit. And there we have the chromosome showing us some genes on the X chromosome. Okay. Any questions about any of that? The genome is all of the genetic material in a cell. For microbes, the genome is also all the genetic material in the organism, because the cell is the organism. The study of genomes is called genomics. We can break uh, genetics into the genotype and the phenotype. The genotype is the actual genes of an organism. So the genes are encoded on the DNA and they have a specific location on the chromosome. And two examples of a genotype would be the gene for blue eyes and then the gene for brown eyes. We can call those alleles, but we don't use that term in this class, okay? We'll just call it the gene for blue eyes and the gene for brown eyes. This is the genotype for a blue-eyed individual is they have two lowercase b alleles. One on the father's chromosome, one on the mother's chromosome. So you, this individual got one lowercase b from their mother, one lowercase b uh, gene from their father. Now, the genotype of the brown-eyed individuals can be capital B, lowercase b, or they could be capital B, capital B. In this case, the brown-eyed allele is the dominant allele, 
and we give it a capital letter to show that it is dominant over the lowercase b. The lowercase b is recessive. That means it does not show if the brown-eyed allele or gene is present. Any question about any of that? The phenotype is the expression of the genes. So in the individual who's lowercase b, lowercase b, their phenotype is they have blue eyes. For the individual which is capital B, lowercase b, and the individuals which are capital B, capital B, their phenotype is they have brown eyes. Any question about any of that? Here we're seeing the chromosome of E. coli. And the chromosome is simply the DNA molecule with all of the proteins attached to that DNA molecule. In E. coli, we do not have histone proteins. No prokaryotes, well, I shouldn't say that, no bacteria have histone proteins. However, eukaryotes have histone proteins on their DNA. It's the main molecule or the main protein uh, in the chromosome. On the chromosome, we have DNA. Let's go back to here. And uh, it's just one gene after the other. Let me see if I can blow that one up over here. So we first have one gene, and then the next gene, and then the next gene, and then the next gene, and they're just located on the chromosome one after the other. It'd be best probably to look at it, looking at the DNA molecule, where gene two follows gene one. Any question about any of that? All right, so DNA is a polymer of nucleotides. We have four nucleotides in DNA, and you have to either know it as adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine, or you need to know it as A, capital A, capital T, capital C, capital G. I don't care how you memorize it, but you should know the DNA is uh, these four nucleotides. DNA is a double helix. That means we have two DNA molecules together to form the dip double helix. The two strands of DNA are only held together by hydrogen bonding between the um, the nitrogen-containing bases, which would be adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine. Okay? Meaning there's no covalent bond between the two strands of DNA. It's only hydrogen bonds. But it's lots of hydrogen bonds because each nucleotide base well, either hydrogen bond with two, if it's A and T, or three, if it's C and G. Okay. The single strand of DNA is held together by a covalent chemical bond. And it's held together between the ribose and the phosphate. Was there a question? I thought I heard somebody. The two strands of DNA are anti-parallel. That means one strand is running this way. Can you see my hand? One strand is running this way. The other strand is running that way. If you want, you can say one of them has the fry prime end at the top. The other one has the three prime end at the top. And I don't know if I mentioned this or not. The phi prime refers to what carbon is up here 
So this is the number five carbon, and this is the number three carbon. And the carbon is in the, uh, the deoxyribose uh, sugar. And you have to be a chemist to know that, okay? Um, but uh, chemists have the carbons numbered. So the string, single strand of DNA is held together by the sugar phosphate backbone, and that is a covalent chemical bond. It's really strong. The uh, double strand is held together only by hydrogen bonds, and each bond, hydrogen bond, breaks and reforms all the time. The double strand DNA is held together because when this bond is broken, this bond here and that bond will be there holding the DNA together. But the double strand does break. And if you simply were to heat it up, you could break all of these bonds. Um, like if you were to heat it up to like 70 degrees Celsius, I think that's the temperature, maybe it's 70 degrees Fahrenheit. No, 70 degrees Fahrenheit would be less than 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. So at 70 degrees Celsius, you would break all of the, the double bonds in the DNA. You don't need to know the temperature, by the way. All right, any questions about DNA? If not, let's talk about the flow of genetic information. Uh, the vertical flow of information within a cell begins at the DNA. So the DNA uh, encodes the genetic information, and that information flows to RNA by transcription. And then that information, the RNA, flows to protein by translation. So this is known as the central dogma in biology, and the central dogma used to be a law in biology, and that is the information flows from DNA to RNA to protein. And in a normal cell, that's the only way the information flows. It doesn't ever flow back the other way. However, we will talk about viruses uh, later in the term, and uh, viruses can have the information flow the reverse way, and it only flows back from RNA to DNA. And we'll talk about that. So you don't need to know that, at least at the moment. The central dogma states the information flows from DNA to RNA to protein. And this is the vertical flow of information within a cell. So when a parent cell is dividing into two cells, that would be the vertical flow of information. It's also the, the flow of information from two parents to one human offspring. Oh, wait a minute. We're not talking about the flow of information between cells. We're talking about the flow of information within cells. So skip what I just said about the flow of information between cells or between generations. We're talking about the flow of information in the cell flowing from DNA to the protein, and it uses RNA in between. The flow of information can occur within a cell. It can happen between generations of cells. That would be a parent cell to two daughter cells. That would also be two parents to one offspring. And the flow can also happen between two cells of the same generation, where one cell donates DNA, which is taken up by another cell, and that we call a recombinant cell. That's the flow of information between cells of the same generation. Okay, I've broken this graph from the way your author was discussing it because it's not obvious what's going on here. Usually the DNA flows out of this cell because this cell dies, 
then we have naked DNA, which is then brought into the recombinant cell. Any question about any of that? All right. Uh, in the vertical flow of information within a cell, the cell information flows from DNA to RNA to protein. The language is slightly different between DNA and RNA. The language is both nucleotides, but it's a DNA nucleotide for DNA, and it's an RNA nucleotide for RNA. There are four nucleotides in DNA. There are four nucleotides in RNA, but then the language switches from nucleotides to amino acids for the protein. And the number of letters in the alphabet also changes because at least in humans, we have 20 different amino acids for a protein. For comparison, English has 26 letters in its alphabet. Okay. So one way of looking at it is when we're talking about the information in the DNA, we could say that is a dog, the original translation of the information in DNA. In RNA, the information would be similar, but there would be a dialect to it. Something like, that is a dog. However, in RNA, I mean, in, in protein, the translation would be something like, quello e un cane. Still the same information, but in a totally different language. Any question about that? If not, let's move on to the vertical flow of information. That's where the DNA flows between cells uh, of a generation, meaning from the parent cell to the daughter cell, or two parents to one offspring. How that happens is, let me blow this up. Um, and just to let you know, it is 620. All right, I've got 619. Let me finish this slide. I'm having a hard time doing this for some reason. I'm just going to blow it up because I'm not seeing how I switch that. Uh, this is a new computer, and I'm not real sure how to work that. Why did that do that? Oh, there it's gone. So DNA replicates semi-conservative. What we mean by that is one strand, the two strands separate, and then one strand is used as a template to make the new strand. How you make the new strand is you read what's on the original strand, a G here, and then you put the corresponding corollary base, which would be a C on the new strand. And then you move to the next nucleotide, which is a C, so you add a G. Any question about any of that? One strand is used as a template to make the new strand, and then you do the same on the other strand of DNA. All right, any question about that? Oops, too far. If not, we'll stop here, and I will see you in the lab.